All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us again here on Lighthouse Discipleship Center. My name is Dave Everett, and uh, we're going to be continuing our service service this morning on knowing the Holy Spirit. And so I'm excited about that. Just before we get into that, I do want to invite you to our Bible study tonight at 6 o'clock on the true nature of God. Uh, and we're almost done with our book. And so once we're done with that, either have to, we might even be finished tonight or next week, we'll be doing a Bible study on the effortless change, which has a lot to do with uh, the sower of the seed and, and being God's word. And so we'll be talking about that uh, pretty soon here. And then we have our Bible study on uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock on the New Year and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me, specifically talking about the Holy Spirit. And so anyway, again, all of our messages are archived on our website at lighthousediscipleship.org, as well as our YouTube channel, Lighthouse Discipleship Center. As well as you can, uh, on our website, you can also uh, donate and, and to give your tithes and offerings to help support our ministry. That's now going worldwide. I mean, on YouTube alone, we have 4,000, almost 4,000 followers now. Uh, so we're reaching uh, uh, quite a bit of territory through just our living room. Uh, Mid COVID, mid everything else, so we're growing. And so. Uh, I'm excited about that. that that's awesome. And, and we still have a pretty large uh, Facebook audience as well. Not, not as large as YouTube. Anyway, enough announcements and all that stuff. Let's get to the Word of God. We're talking about knowing the Holy Spirit. Like I said in previous week, we will talk, uh, we'll get into the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we'll get into tongues, we'll get into the gifts, we'll get into the fruit of the Spirit, we'll get into some of that. that I might not go in a lot of detail with some of that stuff, because uh, that's not the scope of this message. The scope of this message is knowing the Holy Spirit, having a relationship with Him. And one of my key verses I've been using uh, in this message is from uh, uh, Paul's letter in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 14. The last verse of uh, his second letter to the Corinthian church, he says, And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, <coughs> and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And I tried to do this last week, so we'll try it again this week. But uh, uh, I, I don't normally use a message translation, but uh, I did like it in this instance. And so, I don't know if it's going to work for me. No, it didn't work. So, uh, I don't even think I have my card in front of me. So, um, but anyway, I think I can uh, I think I can rephrase it, so I apologize for that. So anyway, um uh, in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, in the message translation, Paul talks about us knowing the amazing grace of our Master, Jesus Christ. And to know the extravagant love of the Father. And to know the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we, we focus a lot about the amazing grace. It is amazing grace. And we talk a lot about the amazing grace in this church. We talk a lot about the extravagant love of the Father in this church. But I also believe we need to talk also about the third member of the, uh, of the Godhead and having an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. Yes, there's power. Yes, there's gifts. And I'm not trying to minimize that at all. Uh, but, I, what I, but I am trying to focus on having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Let me just paint the picture this way. Uh, outside of the Holy Spirit, we've had people come to us for healing. We believe in healing. We teach on healing. We believe that by his stripes we are healed. And I can use hundreds of scriptures regarding that. At the same point in time, there's some people they want the healing more than they want a relationship with the healer. That's wrong. That's backwards. It's, it, we, have, we, we have people coming to us for provision needs. We believe in provide, that God provides. He's our Lord uh, Jehovah. He's our provider. But there's some people they want the provision more than one the relationship with the provider. We believe in salvation. If we don't believe in salvation, why are we here? I mean, uh, but at the same point in time, we believe some people want uh, salvation and the benefits of salvation, which include healing, which include provision, which include other things, um, but no relationship. We're not about religion. We hate religion. Uh, we, we're against religion. Uh, we're about a relationship with God. We're about a relationship with Jesus. We're about a relationship with the Father and a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And we need to know Him. And we can have a relationship. 
I don't know. I don't just know about my wife. I have a relationship with her. And those who are good friends in my life, I don't just know about them. There's plenty of people I know that are friendly. We are friendly in that regard. But there's people in my life, and there have been different people in my life from time to time that. Uh, the re the relationship, the connection is a little more intimate because there's a, actually a friendship. There's actually a relationship. And different different friendships are on different levels. Jesus had a re relationship with the multitudes, but he also had a relationship with the 70. He had a more intimate relationship with the 12. And then he had an even more relationship with the three, uh, Peter, James, and John. And then he had even a, a bigger relationship with the one. And so, uh, and he had a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He would spend the whole night with the Father. Why did he do that? I, I think there's multiple reasons. For one, her time, he didn't have any other time. <laughs> he, people were pressing him for ministry all day long. And yes, that he needs some sleep, yes. But having time with the Father is more, having time with God is more important than anything else. I am not going to be a good husband. I'm not going to be a good fa uh, pastor or anybody if I don't have a relationship with God. That is my first, more, utmost relationship that, that, that is more important than anything else. And so there's times I need to take away from my wife and other things to spend time with my father. And so, and anyway, uh, we want to know the Holy Spirit. Well, <clears throat> uh, last week I, uh, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking different things, and I don't know how long this series is going to be. We're already in week four, and I'm barely getting into some of my notes here. So I don't know. We might be on a long ride here. I don't know. But anyway, but yesterday, last week I introduced the idea of when. And uh, go with me real quick to Acts chapter 2. And that's where this idea is introduced. Acts chapter 2. Uh, actually, we'll start at verse 1. So Acts chapter 2. This is the day of Pentecost. This is when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all flesh upon the church, and the church was born. This is the birth of the church. And we'll spend more time <coughs> excuse me, on even Pentecost in, 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 in the weeks to come. I'll spend probably one whole hour on this whole idea of Pentecost. And, and, and I'll probably be taken from a whole new light that you've probably heard before. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll accomplish that later. Okay? But I want to, I want, in, in this Pentecost uh, event that took place, uh, uh, there's, uh, I just want to extract one thought out of here, and then I want to, I want to go from there. But So Acts chapter 2, we do with verse 1, just for some context. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Okay, that's where we see this wind. The Holy Spirit's coming on the church. It's baptizing the church. We'll talk about verse 3 and other things later. Uh, but there was a mighty rushing wind. Uh, and it, filled, it wasn't as of a rushing mighty wind. It wasn't the wind. <laughs> you know, we're having some wind advisories here in Southern California over the next few days. At least here in Camarillo. I don't know about other parts of California, Southern California. But we have a wind advisory for the next uh, through Wednesday. And so, and actually this year we've experienced, in my opinion, more wind than usual here. Um, this is, uh, I mean, we get some wind sometimes in the spring and, and in the fall when the weather's changing. Uh, but uh, uh, this year it seems like we've had, the weather keeps changing or something. But anyway, uh, when and last week I introduced uh, uh, the thought. I mean, I just I just did some definitions. <coughs> the word spirit is used both in the Greek and the Hebrew, and I just brought out the definitions of those two words in the Hebrew. Again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but it's ruach, and it means by definition spirit, wind, breath, blast of wind, whirl. And then in, uh, in, in the Hebrew. I mean, I, I, excuse me, the Greek is pneuma. And I might, again, might be pronouncing that wrong, but it means current of air, breath, or breeze. But, I mean, the, the word spirit means wind. Among other, some other uh, definitions along those lines, it means wind. And so, that's what the spirit 
uh, mean by definition. So if the word spirit, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, and at Pentecost it, there was a, a, a sound as a, a, a mighty rushing wind, then I think that gives us some things to go on And when we're talking about knowing the Holy Spirit. You know, if I were to introduce you to somebody, like my wife, here's my wife, let me tell you a little bit about her. Hopefully I'm going to tell, her, tell you all of her good points. You know, that, that would be the most, most uh, edifying way to introduce her, you know. But I might say a few things about her. You know, I might say how she's a, uh, how, how she's a lovely wife, how lovely she is, uh, how she's uh, uh, beautiful, how she uh, is a good cook, you can tell. You know, I, uh, you know, I saw my doctor first after being there married two years, and, uh, and, uh, and he goes, he gained some weight. I go, yeah, I got married. <laughs> and so he turned to her because she was in the room, oh, so it's your fault. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, I go, well, she cooks, I eat. And uh, it's worked very well for us so far. And so anyway, uh, that's just a little funny on that. But go with me real quick uh, to John chapter 3, verse 8. Again, I'm doing a little recap from last week, and then I'll get into the new ter territory. But John chapter 3, verse 8. And I'm actually going to read this from the Amplified. So uh, you can go ahead and turn there, but I'm going to read it from a different translation, the Amplified translation. <coughs> and it says the wind blows a breeze where it wills and though you hear its sound that you neither know where it comes from nor where it's going so it is with everyone who is born of the spirit and so Jesus is talking about here and, and here in John chapter 3 he's actually talking to Nicodemus and he's talking about being born again but he also says the wind blows where it wills, and though you hear it, it's sound that you neither know where it comes from <coughs> nor where it's going. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. So I think there's some major truths here. And first of all, just relating the Holy Spirit with wind. Uh, you know, again, I, if I were to introduce somebody, I might tell you a little bit about them. Well, Jesus is introducing to us the Holy Spirit. And one of, one of the attributes, this is not the only attribute of the Holy Spirit, but one of the attributes of the Holy Spirit is like wind. Okay? And so, and there's five things that we're going to go over uh, here, here in just a second. But let me just say this, you know, in response to John chapter 3, verse 8, we don't always know where it comes from. And we, we, in other words, we can't figure God completely out. We want to get to know him, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm going to say something here, and I hope it's funny. I don't mean it to be mean. But there's still things about my wife I'm trying to still figure out. There's still some things about me I'm still trying to figure out. I don't know why I, I, I like certain things and don't like certain things. and why some. We all have our pet peeves. We all have different things. I don't always know why. I know, I do, but I do know I like something. I do know when I don't like something. Uh, you know, I don't always know why. Uh, you know, I'm still getting to know things. Uh, but, you know, there's a song that I, we used to sing, and, and, and I like it. It's called How God's Indescribable. <laughs> He's very indescribable. And we will spend all eternity getting to know God. I mean, uh, uh, so, you know, we don't know everything about him yet. And that's one of the beauties of any relationship is getting to know them. Not just at, in a one-time date, but over a lifetime of marriage and a friendship, a relationship as a family, as friends. And, and, uh, and so we begin to know him, you know. And, uh, we can't see him. We can't see God. We can't see the Holy Spirit. But we know there is, we know there is an effect. We, know, we can know his presence. I can't see the wind, but I know it's here when it's here. I can see its effect. I can feel it when I go outside and it's windy. I can feel it. I can't see it. I don't know where it's coming from. I can't figure it all out. I know there's jet streams. I know there's wind. Uh, but I can't figure it all out. I don't even know really where it comes from. There's probably some scientific answer to this. But, you know, even then, if you told me scientifically where it comes from, I'm like, okay, it's all Greek to me, you know, type of thing. That, you know, that, that, you know, but... We can't see the spirit realm, but we can see the effect of the spirit realm all around us. 
The spirit realm is more real than this thing called flesh. The spirit realm, the spirit of God, God created the natural. The, the, the natural is temporary. It will go away one day. But the spirit will always be here. And so the spirit realm is as real to Jesus as wind is to natural man. The spirit realm is real, just like the wind is real. <clears throat> if you don't believe Jesus is real, if you don't believe the Holy Spirit is real, then in one sense of the world, you don't, you don't believe wind is real. <laughs> you know, wind is real whether you believe it or not. Jesus, the Spirit of God, is real too. Those who don't believe that spiritual things exist are as blind as those who don't believe there is wind because they can't see it. Just because you can't see it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You can't see wind, and it exists. And Jesus is comparing the Holy Spirit to wind. Okay? That's just a simple point. Uh, but but it, it's a point worth taking. But like I said, there's five more observations regarding wind that I want to cover. I'm going to recover the first one from last week, and then we'll get to the other four. The first one is wind has extreme power. Okay? Go with me real quick to to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Again, I'm going to recap a little bit of this because I want to bring all this in context. And I'm going to go back to the New King James here. Bear with me. I'm catching up with myself here. 2 Corinthians, we'll, we'll go ahead and start with verse 1. I really want to get to verse 4, but so we'll, we'll go ahead and read here. So Paul's talking about, he's talking about a lot of things here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. He says, and I, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. How do you know it says in Acts, I'll just pause there just for one second. How do you know it says in Acts 1 8 that the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we shall be witnesses? What does a witness do? A witness gives a testimony. And we are to declare the testimony of God. Uh, We'll get into tongues a little bit later. But when they spoke in tongues, they spoke of the wonderful works of God. We need the Holy Spirit to testify of God. And that is powerful. Verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I talked about it a few weeks back. I didn't even think I even mentioned it last week. That the Holy Spirit will testify of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will make Jesus more real to you. The, the Spirit of truth will bring the Scriptures to your remembrance. The Holy Spirit, well, Paul says, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Well, the Holy Spirit is going to help you, help, help magnify Jesus not only in your life, but through your life to other people. Verse 3, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. Verse 4, and my speech and my preaching <coughs> were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit, which is also pneuma, which is also uh, wind, and a power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I don't want you to have faith in my wisdom, or Andrew Womack's wisdom. I want you to have faith in the wisdom of God, in the power of God, in the Spirit of God. And I want the Holy Spirit in me and through me to lead you to God, to lead you to Christ, so that you can have an own relationship. It's like, it's like one says, I want the Holy Spirit to help me to introduce you to himself. Okay? And then once I introduce you, I want you to have your own relationship. And in that relationship, I also want you to have a relationship with the body of Christ and one another. And that's a whole other aspect we'll get into a little bit later, uh, later down the, uh, in, our, in our message. But when has the potential... The, what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about knowing the Holy Spirit. We're talking about when. And specifically, here we're talking about when has the potential... When, I'm sorry, excuse me. When has extreme power? See, when has the potential of being, of, of being powerful. We want a demonstration of the spirit and power. Wind can be powerful. A breeze is good, but how I many you know a hurricane wind is powerful? A tornado wind is powerful. 
Those two kinds of winds that are very powerful are destructive in nature. Okay? But I talked about how last week God's power is a different kind of power. It doesn't destroy things in one sense, and I'll come back to that. It brings things in order. It doesn't make chaos. It brings chaos into order. Okay? It's a wonderful thing. But before I continue that thought, go with me real quick to 1 John 3. You're in John now, uh, on your Corinthians. Uh, 1 John chapter 3. And we'll go to verse 8. I really just want to tag on the last part of this verse. Um, uh, there's some other things in here, but I really just want to tag on the phrase at the end of, of this verse. So I'll let you get there. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. First John 3, 8, again, I want to really tag on the last part of the verse, but let me go across and read the verse. He who sent is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For the, this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came that he may destroy the works of the devil. And like I said last week, some of you might be saying, but I thought the devil came to save. I mean, I, th I, just, excuse me. I thought that Jesus came to save. I don't know what I'm preaching here. Uh, but anyway, I thought Jesus came to save us. I thought Jesus came to heal us. Yes, he did. But he couldn't save you, and he couldn't heal you if he did not first destroy the works of the devil. He went to the cross to destroy the works of the devil so that you could be, by his stripes, you could be healed. He had to... You, you were cur we were cursed because of the fall. Sickness is a curse. There was no sickness when Adam was created. But sickness is all results of the fall. I can spend hours teaching on that. We've talked about it before. But that's not the scope of my message. But and, but but he had Jesus had to become the curse for us. And die for us, take the penalty of the curse for us, so that we can be blessed. And we are blessed and not cursed. It says in Galatians 3.14, we are redeemed from the curse. Because he became a curse for us. Okay? But he destroyed the works of the devil. And because he has destroyed the works of the devil... Remember, last, I think it was last week in John 16, it says that the Holy Spirit will come, he will... Uh, Convicted world of sin, because they believe me not, of righteousness, because I go to the Father, and the devil, because he is judge. He's destroyed the work. The devil is judge. He's been destroyed. The only, the, the only effect the devil can have is deception, deceiving you. Okay? And how many of you know when you're deceived, you don't know it? If you say you know that you're deceived, that's an oxymoron. That can't happen. You can't be deceived and know it. Because if you, if, you're, if you know you're deceived, you're not deceived. Because you know it. It, it, it doesn't work. Uh, okay? Um, so, he destroyed the works of God. There, there is a, in other words, what I'm really trying to do, wind is powerful. And the strongest winds we know, like a hurricane, tornado, they're destru <coughs> destructive. And Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And there's a destructive force with God that is good. Okay? Um, let me try to get it, uh, make sure I get ahead of myself. You know, it says in John 14, you don't have to turn there. But we spent there, we spent several weeks on there, and we'll keep referring to this. But Jesus said, greater works shall you do, because I go to the Father. Okay? Jesus also said in John 16, 7, that it is expedient that I go, that the Holy Spirit will come. Okay? And, you know, in other words, Jesus said we can do the same works that he did. Jesus destroyed the works of the devil, and he said we can do the same works that he did, and it's expedient that he go, that the Holy Spirit will give us power. To do what? To just one of the things, this is not the only thing, but one of the things the Holy Spirit is going to do in our life, like a mighty rushing wind, is destroy the works of the devil. And what is destroying the works of the devil? He told the 12, he told the 70, and he's told the church, go heal the sick, cast out devils, 
raise the dead, and I, I know I'm getting those out of order, but that is destroying, and part of those, some of those things are destroying the works of the devil. Okay? It's not, yet, I'll get back to some of that now, okay? See, I, I said this last week, and this is very important that you listen to this. Jesus said, a greater works shall we do than he, because he goes to the Father. But many times we try to copy what Jesus did instead of learning how he did what he, he did. We're not just copying what he did, even though we can do what he did. We, are, we need to learn how Jesus did what he did. There's a difference. There's a difference with you just copying what you did and some of us have copied what he did, and we're wondering why it's not working. And we're frustrated. It's not about copying what he did. It's about knowing how he did it. You know, there's some recipes. I can follow the recipe Sherry wrote out. But there's some aspects of some recipes I need to see how she did it. I could copy what she did, but... I need to know how she did that. There's some things like scalding milk. And I'm like, scalding who? Don't scalp me. You know, I know that's a different word, but it's like, you know, it's just, and I didn't know what that word meant. You know, she tried to describe it. And I'm like, you're going to do what? <laughs> you know, I mean, show me how to do that. And I want to see, how, there's something, there's some recipes that she does uh, when she makes homemade waffles, you know, and, and whatnot, and different things. It, there's just a certain way that she does certain things that if you're if you're not if you don't have that precision uh, of how she does it, you can follow the recipe to the T. But if you don't know exactly how she does it, 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 it there's a difference between being good and fabulous. <laughs> there's just a difference sometimes. Okay, but I want I, I want you to know the Holy. See, Jesus didn't even start his ministry till he received the Holy Spirit. He told disciples, don't start your ministry. I'm paraphrasing this till you receive the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to do ministry. And part of that ministry, part of that wind of the Holy Spirit is destroying the works of the devil. Casting out the devil, healing the sick, raising the dead. Those are destroying the works of the devil. Do some other thing. It's not just destroying the works of the devil. It's also speaking life in the situation. And we'll get into that in just a minute. Go me one more scripture. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Verse 38. Now this is Cornelius. Peter's ministering to some Gentiles. Peter's getting a lesson as much as the, the, these Gentiles are getting receiving Jesus. And when Peter's preaching in Cornelius' house, the gospel message, I'm just going to take an excerpt of this message. He says, And now how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and with... I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. Okay? What did Jesus do? He, he, was, he, was, uh, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Okay? Well, God was with him. But God is with you. I spent a whole, uh, I forget how many weeks talking about all the names of God and the name of Jesus and the last name, God, Emmanuel, God is with you. God's with us. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. One of the, <coughs> the last name of, of, of God that we dealt with in the book of Ezekiel talks about how God is always with us. God is with you. Even, you know, God is everywhere. Do you know that when Joel, the, the, the prophet Joel, prophesied that God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh? When God says he'll pour out his spirit upon all flesh? Well, you know what the word all in the Greek and the Hebrew means? All. 
Now, does all has all the world received? Has all flesh received Jesus? No. Has all flesh received the Holy Spirit? No. But the Holy Spirit's there. The Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh. Has all flesh received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? No. Has all some people have rejected the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is everywhere. Okay, you can reject him all you want; he's still there. Okay, now you might you're not going to receive the benefits of that relationship because there is no relationship, but he's still there, and so uh, God is with you. And this holy hurricane, this holy tornado, this holy spirit, this holy wind of God is with you to destroy the devil and reconstruct lives by the wind and power of God. Did you catch that? The Holy Spirit, the holy wind, the holy tornado, uh, hurricane of God, and I, I know I'm, 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 I'm paraphrasing this because I'm trying to bring out this wind, this spirit, this pneuma, this uh, of God, the Holy Spirit, to destroy the works of the devil. See, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is the purpose of the, I can't go about doing good. Like Jesus went about doing good, anointed by the Holy Spirit and with power. There's a lot of people who tell me they have the power of the Holy Spirit, but they're not doing a lot of good. And I'm not trying to put people down. There's some people that all they're doing is bringing chaos and confusion. In Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. And how we treat one another. And so, uh, uh, and th th that's wrong. Okay? But Jesus went about with the Holy Spirit power, healing all who are oppressed. For God was with him, and God is with you. The Holy Spirit is in you. And you can do the works that he did, because he goes to the Father, and the Holy Spirit is in you. Isaiah 61, we'll spend a lot more time on this later, but the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. He's anointed you to heal the to heal the sick, to, 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 to set the captives free, to heal the brokenhearted. If you read Isaiah, especially the first three verses, the whole chapter is amazing. But there are certain things that the, the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is on you to do, to set the captives free, to heal the brokenhearted. And, and, and if, if all you're doing is having a manifestation but there's no good coming out of it. There's no, there's no, uh, you're not destroying the works of the devil. You're just having your own little Holy Spirit party. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, if you want to have a Holy Spirit party, go for it. But at the same point in time, that's not the power. The power is doing good and destroying the works of the devil. It, it, there's a wind about it. You might feel something. You might have a good moment. There's times where Sherry and I, we're just having a good day. We had a good day two weeks ago. We went on a hike. I mean, she's more of a hiker than I am at the end. I'm just like, uh, you know, I'm just I'm worn out. Yesterday, she just she just had a very busy week, and I just said, you need a day off. And we took a day off, of, uh, and, and she even went, and she, and I said, she goes, I don't feel like doing anything. I go, you're not supposed to be doing anything. You're having a day off. Well, I don't feel motivated. You're not supposed to be motivated when you're having a day off. You're supposed to be motivated to do nothing. I go, that means it's working. Okay? And so it, it's okay. But anyway, it's just a, you know. But but then by the evening and the day, she's, you know, the smile came back. You know, not that she was frown, frowning yesterday, but just at that point in time, I could just tell she's tired. I was, I, I've been there, you know. And we, you just can't go in all cylinders when you're tired. You know, God didn't make us go seven days a week. He gave us a day of rest. And so, uh, anyway, it just, it just, the other six days will be brighter and sunnier if you, if you learn how to take, uh, take some rest. Anyway, let's get to the other points. The second one I want to talk about is that the wind brings refreshing and rest. You know, some people, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, they're like, they're afraid because they've seen some things, or they've heard of some things, and they're like, what's going to happen to me? They're afraid. They don't want to turn some lunatic. And I'm not saying other people are lunatics. That's not what I'm saying. But some people are afraid. They're seriously fearful of receiving the Holy Spirit because they don't want to turn out to be like someone else, some other experience that they've seen that they didn't understand. They didn't know what was going on. And I don't, I don't necessarily know if that, if that experience that they saw was, was the Holy Spirit or not the Holy Spirit. I'm not here judging that. I, but I am trying to, but there is a refreshing 
that comes with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to bring out a few scriptures on this. I don't have a lot to say on this, but, uh, you know, uh, let me just say this way uh, before I go into these scriptures. Dwayne Sherrill, uh, one of the pastors that we, 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 we have in our Bible classes and we, we really respect, he's one of the teachers and instructors for Andrew Womack's ministry. He has 13 churches nationwide, uh, whatnot. So last we heard, he might remember more now, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, he was teaching about the Holy Spirit and uh, regarding this refreshing. And he just spoke of his grandmother. His grandmother used to work in the cotton fields in the Carolinas back in, back in the day. And how do you know the, the South can be very humid? Very humid, very sticky. And, and, and you're working out in the field in the hot heat with the humidity, you know, you, you're just torture as far as I'm concerned. But she said, what, he, she was saying once in a while they would get this whirlwind. It's just uh, this, this breeze. And she would just be there, oh, sweet Jesus. Oh, sweet Jesus. You know, I don't know if you've ever been hot or whatever. And, you know, uh, we lived in the Midwest for a couple of years. Uh, uh, and so, you know, we like the sun because we get, we get humid. And when those thunderstorms come, and I'm not necessarily uh, all for that, but I did, I did like them because they were adventurous for me. But anyway, but anytime the thunderstorms came, there was that nice breeze afterwards. It was, and, it, and so I just liked that. It was just, and it was a refreshing from that wind, from that, uh, you know. And so, uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> I mean, have you been in a hot day and you go to a store or whatever and they got the air conditioning on? <laughs> Or they got a fan on, and you're just like, oh, yes. It's refreshing. There's a rest to that. There's some scripture that talks about this. Uh, Isaiah 63, I want to be a little quick with this. I took too long on the letter, so I want to speed up a little bit. Uh, Isaiah 63, verse 14. It says, as a beast goes down to the valley, and the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. And uh, this is just one of, one of the scriptures I want to bring out real quick. There's a rest that the Holy Spirit brings. This doesn't so much talk about the refreshing, but it's talking about a rest. But how many knows a rest is refreshing? Sherry, I mentioned that she was tired yesterday. After breakfast, she went back to bed for a while. And she felt refreshed. How many of you, how many of you know that, you know, when you, you know, uh, I, I even worked a lot yesterday, and I, I finally, finally by uh, 10 o'clock, I just couldn't work anymore. <laughs> My brain was just seeing sideways, and so, uh, I, but I got a good night's sleep, and I feel refreshed this morning, okay? Uh, and so, the resting is refreshing, but it says, as the beast goes down into the valley, and the, the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. God wants to give you rest. God wants to refresh you with the Spirit so that He can make His name glorious to you. Okay, you might not be able to connect all the dots with that yet, but uh, uh, there's something refreshing about the Holy Spirit. There's something restful about the Holy Spirit that will empower you to lead you to bring glory to His name. Okay? Uh, Isaiah 28, real quick. Isaiah 28, verse 12. I apologize if I got a little faster. I am trying to speed up just a little bit because I want to get to uh, hopefully all five names and all five expressions of the wind today. To whom he said, this is the rest, Isaiah 28, 12. To whom he said, Paul actually quotes this from Corinthians chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 12. He said, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you, we may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Actually, let me back up real quick. Let's go, I mean, let me read it again from verse 11. Sorry if I'm confusing. Isaiah 28, 11 to 12. For with stammering lips and un another tongue, he shall, will speak to this people to whom he said, This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. We're going to talk about tongues later on in our study. Uh, and we're talking about tongues right now on Wednesday nights, uh, speaking in tongues. But. Paul quotes this from Corinthians when he's talking about tongues. He quotes from Isaiah. He talks about this is the rest. This is the refreshing. And, and we'll talk more about this, but there's a refreshing. There's also a verse in excuse me, the book of Jude. And I'm not going to turn there, but Jude verse 20 says, Build yourself in your most holy 
faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Those are edifying. Those are building up. Those are refreshing. Those are rest from speaking in tongues and praying in the Holy Spirit. We'll spend more time on this. I don't, I'm not going to make a major point right now. But let, let me go one more scripture before we go to our next point. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent therefore, Acts 3.19, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. There's a lot I can say about this, and I don't have a lot of notes on this, but there's a refreshing of the Holy Spirit. And there's a refreshing of His presence. You know, one thing about wind is you can't see it, but you can feel its presence. And there's something refreshing about the presence of God. I mean, I mean, and if, we all know we are living in very evil times. We are living in very dark times, nationally and globally. But even as dark as it gets, there's a secret place we can always go to. We can, no matter how dark it gets, they can shut down our churches, they can take our Bibles away, but we have His Word written on our hearts and we can spend time in the Holy Spirit wherever we are. Corey Tim Boom did in the consecration camps. And we have a secret place that we can get refreshed and rest, and that is in His presence. Yes, we can spend time with Jesus. Yes, we can spend time with the Father, and we should. But we can also spend time with the Holy Spirit where there's refreshing. And there's a wind, in other words, there's a there's a wind. There's a there's a secret place of his presence. We can go to always be refreshed. He's open 24-7. You ever have a sleepless night? There's been times where I've had a sleepless night and I started praying in tongues and I went sleep like that. <laughs> you know? And then there's times where I just had the most radical time of God. You know? Um, I haven't gotten the tons yet, but there's a refreshing. You know, sometimes I can't sleep. Usually, I'm, I rarely do I have a night where I can't sleep. I'm, I usually fall asleep once I hit the pillow, and I, I, I don't wake up hardly at all. Uh, I never use the restroom. I, I, mean, I, don't, I, I, I I'm out until I wake up. But once in a while, I can't use that because I can't turn off this guy. I'm thinking about something. Whether it be something I'm excited about or something I'm anxious about. Usually that's the case. i got something I can't turn off. And sometimes if I just start praying in the Spirit, it's just a refreshing in my life. There's just something that just recharges and just refreshes. And, I, and, it's, uh, uh, and it just works. And, uh, and if there's other manifestations of this, we'll talk about more about this refreshing uh, when we talk about the tongues, okay? So, the wind is extreme power, and wind had a refreshing. And the third thing I want to talk about is wind is unseen, but felt. Wind is unseen, but felt. Again, from John 3, 8, you don't have to turn there. And I'm just paraphrasing. You, can't, you don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know where it's going. How many, has any, nobody has ever seen wind. But I know we all felt it. Some people have felt it more than others. I've never experienced a hurricane. I've never experienced a tornado. I've had some, my, uh, some powerful whirlwinds. I've, even here in Southern California, I used to work on the playground with the kids, and we had a whirlwind that was blowing some kids over and the dumpster over. <laughs> and it wasn't a tornado, but it was a strong whirlwind. We actually had the kids just, uh, you know, sit, sit down, and, you know, and it, it, it passed by, it went real, real, real quick. But for these little kids, these kindergartners, it was sick, scary. You know, it was a strong wind. And so we don't experience that here very often. There, was no, there wasn't even a cloud in the sky, but there was a whirlwind. And so, uh, you know, it was strong. And so, um, but anyway, wind is unseen but felt. You can't see the wind, but you can feel it and you can see its effects. Okay? Now, this, this aspect of the wind makes some intellectuals uncomfortable because you can't figure him out. Some people, <coughs> intellectuals, want to figure it all out. But there's some things you just can't figure out. Okay? And that makes some people uncomfortable. You can't, you can't always understand everything. Okay? But you can learn to discern his presence. 
You can learn to discern his breath. You can learn to discern feeling something or sensing something from the Holy Spirit. You can learn to witness its effects. <coughs> now, let me talk about feelings. We talk a lot about feelings in a negative sense sometimes, but I want to talk about it in a positive sense. How do you know God gives feelings? Okay? One of our senses, five senses, is feel. We, we can feel things, okay? Or touch. We are not led by our, let me, and hear me carefully on some of these notes. We are not led by our feelings. We are led by the Spirit of God. That's important, okay? But feeling, just because we are not led by our feelings, doesn't mean feelings are bad. It doesn't mean feelings are taboo. Okay? We are led by the Spirit of God, but feelings are not bad. Feelings are not taboo. Don't let your feelings control you. But don't suppress your feelings. Don't suppress the presence of God. Don't let your feelings control you. But I also, on the other side of the coin, don't suppress. Don't su the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness. Don't let your feelings control you. But we're not being led by our feelings. We're being led by the Spirit of God. It says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Our flesh, our natural flesh, does not want to be loving, does not want to be peaceful, does not want to be joyful, does not want to be gentle and kind and, gent and gentle. And, and there's other nine aspects of it. Through the Spirit. But we're not controlled by our feelings. We are led by the Spirit of God who is love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness. Don't be controlled by your feelings, but be led by the Spirit of God. Don't be controlled by your spirits, feelings, and don't suppress feelings. Don't suppress peace. Don't suppress joy. Don't suppress love. Don't suppress gentleness and kindness. And goodness, temperance, self-control. I know I didn't list them all. Faith, or faithfulness. I think I'm still missing one. But, see, Jesus was moved by compassion. I'll spend a whole hour or two on this later on. Jesus had compassion on the multitudes to feed them, to do miracles. Jesus had compassion to heal the sick, to raise the dead. He was moved by compassion, which is the fruit of the Spirit. He's not moved by his feelings. He's not controlled by his feelings, but he wasn't going to suppress either. I want to, these, these, these 4,000 people, 4,000 multitudes have been following me for days, and we need to feed them. He didn't have any food, but by compassion, he was moved to feed them, even though he didn't even have a lunch, the boy did. And he multiplied it, using the gifts of the Spirit to multiply the, the food. That's a miracle. Okay? He was moved by compassion. Okay? You can't, you can't feel it, but you can see its results. Okay? You can, I, can, I can feel God's compassion, and God is going, going to lead you by his spirit, which is love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness. Okay? See, sin will harden your heart where you don't feel. Sin will harden your heart where you don't have empathy for people. Sin will harden your heart where you don't have sympathy for people. Sin will harden your heart where you don't have compassion on people. Sin will harden your heart when you don't have mercy and grace towards people. Sin will harden your heart when you don't have joy. So, because you suppress your feelings, you have to get ungodly to feel something. And grieve the Holy Spirit, as it talks about in Ephesians chapter 4. How do we grieve one spirit? When we strive and envy towards one another, not forgiving one another. That grieves the Holy Spirit, according to Paul. And I agree with that. 
Again, John 3.8 says you don't, you, can't, you, don't know, you, you don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. But you felt something. And you can, if you are going to uh, yield to the Holy Spirit, and if you're going to have a relationship with knowing the Holy Spirit, because that's really what we're talking about, you can be led to the Holy Spirit to have compassion on people. Even in the midst of uh, a tragedy, you can be led by the Holy Spirit to have joy and peace. Okay? To help you through situations. Feelings are not bad. We just can't let them dictate doctrine in our lives. Doctrine is just teaching. Okay? And there's some scriptures. I wish I had time to bring them out and look them all up. I'm running out of time. But sin, will, again, will harden your heart. It says in Ephesians 4, 18 and 19, I'm not going to read, turn there, but especially in the Amplified. I encourage you to read it later if you have time. But Ephesians 4, 18 and 19 in the Amplified, it talks about how sin will cause your heart to be callous and past feeling. Sin will cause your heart to be callous. There's some other attributes to it. Those are only two of the attributes I'm bringing. There's actually some other attributes to this. But sin will cause you to be callous and past feeling. Sin will cause you to grieve the Holy Spirit. But we don't walk. If we walk according to the Spirit, Paul says, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And our flesh lusts for things. And a lot of times when we think about when we think about lust, we think about immoral things. But your flesh can lust. You know, when you were two, you wanted mine, 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 mine. <laughs> That's lust. <laughs> okay? That's lust working. James talked about lust will lead to sin. You know, sometimes we lust to be depressed. Sometimes we lust to, to be hateful and vengeful at somebody. Sometimes we lust for things like that. Some, I mean, I can't, I'm not saying all we all do, but I've, I've heard things like that. You know, I, I, you know uh, there's sometimes where I'm trying to encourage myself or I'm trying to encourage my wife or a friend. And, you know, we are, we, I think we've all experienced being in a bad mood. Sometimes we're tired. Sometimes there's been a lot of things going on and we are just fit to be tied, and we are just, uh, you know, we, and someone just pushed our buttons too many times. It's kind of like a movie elf on the elevator and hit all the buttons, you know. And somebody, someone just hit that button, and I just can't get, I can't just seem to shake this mood. You know, you try to encourage them, and, that, and the more you try to encourage them, they get worse. <laughs> you know, and I've done that. I've been there. She tried to encourage me when I've been in that. And, it, and, you know, I'm not justifying the mood. I'm just stating what it is. But, but you know, there's some people, they are just, and you try to encourage them, you know, you're just determined to be mad, aren't you? <laughs> then they may agree or disagree, but their actions are very, very, very firm on that. But, you know, you know, but then there's some times where, especially when Sherry and I are going through a hard time about something, so sometimes I will just crank up the worship music, music or something, go out praying the Spirit, and says, I know my flesh wants to be ornery, cranky, mad, upset, you know, uh, just ball out my eyes. I've been there too. I've done it where I've cried for days, you know, about something. And, and my flesh just wants, wants it so bad. But I'm also saying, you know what? Enough is enough. And I'm going to get in God's presence. I'm going to get into the wind of the pneuma of God and the spirit of God. I may not feel it. I, you know, I might not see it. But I'm going to feel his presence. And I'm going to let his presence change my attitude. And some of our attitudes need to be changed. And, you know, let me just say, this way. whether I'm preaching or someone like Andrew or Lawson or uh, Dwayne Sheriff is preaching or someone else that we know is preaching, I might not see, uh, I might not see it happen, but I know the Spirit of God is touching lives. I can't see it, but I can see its effect. And, I, and, and so the Holy Spirit is extremely powerful, it's refreshing, and it's unseen, but it's felt. You can feel its presence. The fourth thing, wind cannot be controlled. Wind cannot be controlled. You can't control wind. Wind blows wherever it wishes. You can't bottle it up. You can't control it. it you can't control the wind, but I can't prepare. I can make appointments with the wind, with the spirit. I can brace myself 
both the unexpected but unexplainable for the supernatural. You know, through the years, from even some well-meaning people, some friends, even people I admired, have told me, and give me false accusations of, of setting appointments. And, and, and it says, so some people, they believe, and other pastors think that you shouldn't prepare messages. You should just speak spontaneously and let the Holy Spirit lead you. I've let, I've let the Holy Spirit lead me spontaneously. And those have been some great messages. But I also know there's been some messages that the Holy Spirit led me all week, all month to prepare and give them over to. And yet they say, you're controlling the Holy Spirit, yet they're the ones trying to control me. You know? And I think we can make appointments with the Holy Spirit. We can make appointments with God. I think we also need to be, you know, I might have, I might have a message for the day or even the night in our Bible study, and the Holy Spirit wants to go the new direction. I'll do it. I've done it before. At the same point in time, that doesn't mean that God can't, I can't have an appointment. He, yes, he goes wherever he wills. He's my Lord. He's my God. He's my king. I don't control him. I, I yield to him. But at the same point in time, that doesn't mean I can't make an appointment with him. We have a wind advisory sometimes. I can't control it, but I can. I can control some aspect of it. If there's something that I believe that might be dangerous or blown away, I can I can adjust it, you know. Um, and there's some things I can do uh, to to make an appointment with him. Okay. In reality, I am not controlling the Holy Spirit, but sometimes my my accusers have controlled me by telling me how I can prepare messages. Some people have accused me from time to time by starting a time and ending a time. Well, the Holy Spirit just let the Holy Spirit free, you know. I believe, I, I'm okay, we've had, you know, back in my high school days, we had some times where we just worshipped all day, prayed all day. There's times for that. Those are awesome times. I can't say I have those every day, you know. But to say that I can't be punctual, to say that I can't start and end things on time, well, God is very punctual. Okay? The Passover, the, the first Passover in the book of Exodus, chapters 12, 13, and 14, in that territory, there was a date on the calendar. There was an exact time. There was an exact date. There was preparation being done for that Passover. And all the Passovers that took place. There was preparation. It was an exact date. Pentecost. I've said this before. The word Pentecost means 50 days. We're going to spend a whole, uh, whole, whole hour on some of this about Pentecost. But Jesus told them to wait and make an appointment on the exact time and date for the Holy Spirit to come, which is Pentecost. Okay? The Sabbath. The Sabbath is a weekly date. Every seven years was a Sabbath year. Jubilee, every 50 years was the exact date and time when the trumpet was supposed to be blown and all captives were free. All debts were erased. It was a date with God. God, the God of creation, created the sun, the moon, the stars, the planet that rotate by season, by time, everything rotates. I mean, we have uh, Hades Comet that comes every so year. I mean, all these different things in our solar system happen by time. They, they, they come at the precise time. We just have Jupiter and Saturn come close together, and it comes every, uh, I think, 800 years or something. God has made a specific time for so many different things. He's created the seasons. He created all these different things. God it can God is a God of order. You can't control him, but he is a God of order. We can, you know, there's days like yesterday where I tell Sherry, just be free. Feel free to be lazy. But then there's some days where we think, you know what, we gotta roll up the sleeves and we gotta we gotta get to work. And we we got deadlines and we need to meet our deadlines. There's times that we need to be punctual, and there's times where we can just, oh, sweet Jesus. <laughs> oh, sweet Jesus. And sometimes, you know, and so uh, you can't control the Holy Spirit, but you can be led by the Holy Spirit. Okay? We can prepare our hearts to receive from the Holy Spirit and experience intimacy with God. Spend intimacy with the Holy Spirit to have an intimate <coughs> friendship with God. We can't control God, but we can create wind-friendly zones. Otherwise, people get get hurt. 
and confuse us. You know, I want people to feel free to, to flow the Holy Spirit in this church. But I also want to explain some things to people so they don't get confused. So they are not scared. Some people have been so confused by some of the, the wind that's taken place that they never wanted to come back to church ever again. Something's wrong with that. Something's dangerous about that. Okay? Things can be done freely, but they can also be done decently in order. We can test things. We can prove things. I don't have time to turn to some of these scriptures, but in 1 John 4 1, we can try the try we can test things. We can we we don't we judge things by its appearance. Okay? But we can also know we can sense things by the Holy Spirit. That was a little strange. That was a little bizarre. And I also know by the effects. Did it bring confusion to the rest of the body? Did it bring confusion to the house? Because the Spirit of God edifies. And so, uh, the, and the Holy Spirit knows that those people in the room would be confused by that manifestation. The Holy Spirit's not going to confuse people. The devil is off at confusion. The devil can do things to, uh, to bring confusion. He can even use good things. He can even use... Uh, someone who's filled the Holy Spirit, the bill prompted the, 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 the act out of manifestation, and it brings confusion, dis disorder, and chaos. And that win that is powerful can be destructive in a negative sense. Okay? I don't want to misrep God, misrepresent God and bring confusion and hurt and pain. So some people, they've been so, they've been, they, they, and, you know, yes, they need to get over, and yes, they need to, to be taught, but they were hurt by it. And, uh, but, but we need to have, sometimes, win advisories. And so win advisories are always appropriate. But let me just say this. God, the Holy Spirit may act out at any moment, but he will always act out with extravagant love. He will always act out with compassion. He will always act out with the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, he would always act out. And, it, it, you know, I mean, it, it would be just one of those things where, that was good. <laughs> that was good. Uh, uh, Jesus went about doing good, not about to bring confusion. I mean, it, you know, I understand, like, we don't want to understand everything about God, but we don't mean to walk away from church or walk away from a, a spiritual setting and say, what was that <laughs> type of thing? You know, we should say, I don't know what that was, but that was good. I want more of that. And that should be the effect of that. Uh, you know, so let me go with the five, fifth thing real quick. So again, the wind is powerful. It's refreshing. It's unseen but felt. It can't be controlled. And the fifth thing is wind opens doors for beautiful gifts. Wind opens doors for beautiful gifts. I don't know about you in your home. I know that sometimes in, in this house, in the last house we were at, wind has done two things. Sometimes, especially in our bedroom, because we have a sliding glass, a glass door and we keep it open a lot. If we don't have a, a door stop in front of it, the wind will shut it real quick. And it's there at our old house, too. Uh, and so the wind will shut the door. But the wind has also opened doors. If our front door isn't open, shut tightly and we have a windy day, it's opened the door before. It did at our last house. We're just sitting there watching TV, and all of a sudden the door opens. <laughs> you know, and it can seem a little bit freaky. Yeah, like, uh, come on in. You know, um, but the, <clears throat> and, and you know, the door, the wind can open things, especially with a strong wind, a, a hurricane, tornado type wind. It can open a lot of different things. But remember, the spirit of God is is uh, is uh, it doesn't bring chaos. He it's, it's, it, it brings peace. It brings harmony. The Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit also comes with gifts. And we're going to be talking about gifts later on. But wind opens doors, opens windows for new opportunities to minister, okay, and whatnot. The Holy Spirit brings new ministry gifts, opens doors that otherwise would never have been opened. You know, there's times where I'm just in a situation or whatever, and unless the Holy Spirit opens the door, I can't minister. I can't. You know, there's some people. Uh, unless God softens their heart, I can't minister to them. I just can't. You know, the Holy Spirit's got to soften their hearts and make them teachable. I can't force it. 
But the Holy Spirit can soften their hearts if they are. But some people, the Holy Spirit tried to soften their hearts and they, they might have worked, but then they closed back up again. You know, and so the Holy Spirit has got to open that flower. You, can, you know, unless the flower is open, you can't germinate. You know, uh, and so sometimes you've got to use a little love to open that flower. Because if you try too hard, you're going to just close that flower. And uh, it, it won't, won't work. But the Holy Spirit can open the door. Go with me real quick. We'll, we'll probably close with this verse. But uh, Luke chapter 4. I could go to Isaiah 61, but this is where Jesus is quoting from Isaiah. Luke chapter 4, but I want to give, uh, I want to read it from this one. Luke chapter 4. This is after Jesus has received the Holy Spirit. He had the temptation in the wilderness. And then he comes into the synagogue and he preaches and he ministers this message. From Isaiah 61, he, he's reading from but in, in Luke 4, 18 and 19, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. There's a lot there. But the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Why is God upon me? To preach the gospel, to heal the sick. To bring recovery, to bring liberty to the captives, to recover your sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed. The Spirit of God is upon me. The gifts that we're going to talk about later on in our series, the tongues, everything that we have, everything we have in this relationship, this friendship with the Holy Spirit, is opening doors to minister. That's why the Spirit of the Lord has anointed you. That's why the Holy Spirit is upon you. That's why we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, greater works shall we do than these, because he goes to the Father and the Holy Spirit will come. Jesus said, it's more ex expedient for you that I go, that, you, that the Holy Spirit may come. Why? So that we can preach the gospel. We can, we can proclaim liberty to the captives, the cover of sight to the blind, and, and, and set the press free. <clears throat> okay? In other words, when I teach this out of Isaiah, this is Jubilee language. If you understood Jubilee, it talks about this in Leviticus chapter 25 or 26. I think it's 25. Uh, but Jubilee happened every 50 years, just like Pentecost happened on the 50th day. And so, at Pentecost, on the Day of Atonement, the priest was Sandy's Sandy ram's horns. Ram's horns speak what of? The cross. Jesus is the lamb. He's the ram. Okay? And that took away the sins of the world. Jesus is the Lamb. And these rams would, would blow the trumpet on the Day of Atonement. The to Day of Atonement speaks of the cross. And it was, every 50 years, it was by command. It was by the command that every prisoner was set free and every debt was, it was expunged. And every man got to go home. It was Jubilee. It says in Psalm 89, Blessed are those who know the joyful sound. What joyful sound? The sound of jubilee. This passage here in Isaiah is talking about the sufferable year of the Lord. The sufferable year of the Lord is jubilee. Jubilee is setting the captives free. Jubilee is slaying the prisoners go home. We have been filled with the Holy Spirit there to do greater works than he did so that we can set the captives free. We can bring jubilee to people's lives. Not confusion, but liberty. And justice for all. <laughs> so like I do in the Pledge of Allegiance here, you know? To do good. To be a blessing. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. To do good. To be a blessing. To bring deliverance. To bring the, the breath and presence of God. To bring this refreshing. We're not the source, but we are the vessel. Paul said, I remember I, I, we went to Corinthians earlier, that the demonstration of the Spirit and power, that you would know this power is from God and not man. We are God's vessels. To demonstrate, he talked about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that we are his vessels. So we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the household of God so that we can show people the excellent works of God. To be a blessing and destroy the works of the devil. There's different expressions of the Holy Spirit that people have experienced in years. 
There's a joy that is so uncontainable. I mean, David, when one time he was worshiping God on the way home, one of his wives despised him for doing so in such a manner, and he just said, I will be more undignified than this. There's a, you know, there's a time to, 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 to be modest in a sense. I'm not, I'm not talking about being immodest, but there's a time where we just need it. We have something to celebrate. <laughs> we have something to shout. We have something to, uh, the joy unexpressible. Because if you don't have a joy unexpressible, you are not experiencing God's presence, at least in that moment, you're not. No. There needs to be, and yes, because we have such a joy that, that uncontainable, there needs to be, there needs to be outlets to be able to express that. But the, that does not mean we need to scare and spook everyone else. There needs to be outlets where we can express this inexpressible joy, and, and there's many manifestations of that, but we don't need to scare everybody else in the process. We don't need to create a circus. But we do need to be able to express. God, am I making sense? I want there to be freedom to express. And at that same point in time, I do not want to confuse other people. So there has to be that balance. And that's what a pastor can tell. You know, there have been times where some of our Bible studies, we had, when I, we, we just ministry time. And, and I liked it. I loved it. There was a season where after the ministry, the people started ministering to each other. And every once in a while, someone said, oh, pastor, you should be doing this. I go, no. I taught you so you could do it. <laughs> and I'm loving it. And I would just let I would just stand back and let, watch, watch them do it, and it was awesome because that's the way it should be. And but then once in a while, it didn't happen very often. But once in a while, someone would say something, and I could see at one a few people, usually the younger Christians, but there was this confused look on their face. And I I didn't mean to interrupt. I just I just brought clarity to what just was said or what happened or sometimes corrected what maybe was said. And then I said, okay, carry on. You know, I just, I didn't want to leave them with confusion because that confusion could, could shipwreck the whole thing. Okay? And I wanted to bring clarity and to, to erase the confusion because the Bible says in James chapter 3, verse 16, when there's envy and strife, there's, there's every evil work. There's confusion in every evil work. Now, the, in this instance, there wasn't an envy and strife. There was sometimes, you know, maybe just a better way of explaining it. Or I just need a little more explanation. Or maybe what they said was not it was not completely correct. And so once you, you know, uh, <clears throat> once you brought the explanation, it was fine, and then just carried on. We've been talking about, we're going to continue talking about the Holy Spirit is our friend. We want to have an intimate friendship with Him. And the Holy Spirit can breathe power, refreshing, and rest into our lives. He can give us gifts that are a beautiful thing. There's nothing to be fear, fearful of, of, of knowing and walking in the Holy Spirit. No, you see, in most churches I've been a part of, no one disputes or quits going to church over the gifts, usually. Mo in other words, let me say that I've never seen hardly anyone leave a church because it was miracles taken. I've hardly ever seen anyone leaving the church because there was someone someone got healed. They did in Jesus' day, but not I here. And I, I haven't hardly seen anyone leave the church because of a word of wisdom or faith or whatnot. The elephant that's in the room many times is this issue called tongues. And some of these other manifestations that take place from time to time. Where uh, it brings confusion or a bad experience. That's because there needs to be some teaching on it. And there's not a lot of teaching out there. Are there? There's not a lot. I want people to run with the wind. You know, sounds like a movie title. Run with the wind. But at the same point in time, I believe there needs to be a balance and there needs to be uh, thoughtfulness of who else might be in the room. And at the same point in time, I think we just need to be taught. And that's the job of the pastor. That's the job of the, uh, the, the teachers, pastors and teachers to teach the people and it's our job as a people to listen and to be taught 
and to, to, to do things. Because I want to be effective. I don't want to be, I'm, I know I've done things wrong. I know I've said things wrong. I know I've hurt people and different things. And I've, you know, and, 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 and so I want to make those right at the point when they happen. Um, but at the same point in time, uh, you know, uh, my, my, my point here right now is that I want you to know the Holy Spirit. I don't want to just you to copy what Jesus did. I want you to know how he did it. And the, the Holy Spirit's like wind. And God wants to blow in and through your life like a mighty rushing wind. He wants to refresh you. He wants to empower you. He wants you to feel his presence. He wants you to, to uh, uh, operate in his gifts. He wants to give you windows of opportunity and minister and different things of that nature. And so, uh, Lord, we just worship you. We magnify you. Lord, I pray, Lord, we're not done with the, these teachings yet about knowing you. We just talked about the wind today. But Lord, even though what we talked about so far, Lord, help teach you. I pray for each of us, including myself, you would take us into new levels of our relationship with you like we have never known before. That's not religious, but it's real. It's authentic. It's real. Because in these last days, we need your Holy Spirit, not just so we can survive, but we need your Holy Spirit so the church can thrive. And we need a revival. And I thank you for a great awakening that will start in your house, in your church, in your people. It will start with us. In Jesus' name we give you thanks. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock on the True Nature Path.